This kind of feels like having a guard tower, you know, looking down into your backyard. John Taylor doesn't pull any punches in describing the new home going in just behind him in Seattle's Laurelhurst neighborhood. We don't know one neighbor who, who, who likes it. This house, about 20 feet wide and 30 feet tall, is getting shoehorned into a side yard that was once a remnant lot, according to old tax records. Around 200 homes like this have been built all around Seattle. That's thanks to a 1957 law where the city gave property owners a grace period to take lot lines and create buildable lots or have those lot lines extinguished. That grace period was renewed about 20 years later, then forgotten about. I don't think it was done on, on purpose by the city to, to, to create these kinds of opportunities, but it's, it's clearly an example of bad public policy to allow it to happen. But is it bad public policy or an efficient way to put more housing in a city where there's high demand? We have to have density. In order to be a, a successful city, we have to provide housing for all the jobs here. Anthony Mashmet is the founder of Dwell Development, which is building the first phase of the Rainier Vista project in the Rainier Valley. It's a development near light rail with 42 units that cost around $400,000 each. You can see how thick these walls are going to be. The homes are also at least 50% more energy efficient than city code requires, some as high as 90% more efficient. When you have 10 inch walls full of insulation and triple pane windows, you don't need to have a lot of mechanical load in the house because you're keeping everything in. When it comes to bigger houses on smaller lots, Moshmed says developers are simply finding opportunities and playing by the rules. It's completely not a loophole. It's, it's the code, it's the law. That said, he'd like to make sure the city, neighbors, and developers figure out how to make sure adding new homes doesn't add any new problems. There's a compromise. I think there's ways the city can give on, on some aspects of, of density and, and the builders and developers can recognize that maybe there's other opportunities elsewhere to, to get the density that we need. A lot of this is not so much even the impact as the kind of shock and surprise of finding something happen. Council member Richard Conlon chairs the council's land use committee. He helped put a temporary year-long emergency stop on the big house tiny lot situation last September. And the whole point of this is to get the discussion started. So he and his committee are now reviewing a proposal by the Department of Planning and Development for a permanent law that would eliminate the use of historic lot lines. The proposal would also allow homes on lots as small as 2,000 square feet, but those houses could only be around 18 feet tall. When you have a lot that is smaller than the standard, then you would have to have a house that is smaller than the standard. Conlin is hoping the new law is on the books by September, as the temporary ban on big homes on small lots expires, and the city looks to put this controversy to rest. And that's really what we're trying to do, is create the kind of conditions that will make things predictable for people, know what's happening, and have more houses where it's possible. John Taylor says the new law would bring him some comfort to know other homes in the future wouldn't be affected like his. The problem now? The permit for the house behind him has been issued and there's no turning back. He, like hundreds of others in Seattle, will have a new neighbor high above him whom he won't be that comfortable with. Unfortunately, maybe uncomfortable for them as well because they're going to have to understand that we probably aren't all that happy.